So the first of our phantom authors this morning is a man who's not even seen his book yet. That's because it hasn't arrived from the printers, unfortunately. So we please welcome the author of Operation Hate, The Truth Behind the Killing Stone, Mr. Richard Franklin. Hello, good morning. I think I'll get a bit further away yeah. from you. Yeah. 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 Too, <laughs> too close, too close. Sorry. So Richard, sadly your book hasn't turned up. I'm not Sir Richard. I said sadly Richard. Oh, sadly. oh right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not, not yet. Not, not, not yet. Yeah. The knighthood's next year, I believe. Yeah, I believe so, yeah. yes. Um, mm. so, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you, because you hadn't even seen the front cover. No. No. This morning, because no. what we had planned was we were going to have the box of books, and Richard was going to see it for the first time, and he could have either gone, "That's lovely," or "What the f is that?" So I for, wouldn't do that. You'd probably say afterwards. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I would like to give you this, Richard, oh. which is a copy of oh. the first front cover of the book, and that's for you to take away with you. Oh, thank you, Ian. Don't very much. Don't sell it. And, <laughs> no, I certainly um, won't. I said that's fantastic. So there we go. And to just so that's oh, for lovely. you. Thank so you. Very like to it's not too to... heavy either, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> and just to let you all know, you can order the book today from Richard upstairs. You will order the book today. <laughs> and what we'll do, it will be a dedicated signed copy which will get in the post to you. So if you order from Richard upstairs. And also to take away from you is um, a printed copy of two chapters which lets which takes you into the story and leaves it on a nice little cliffhanger. So we will speak more about that. So, and those are free to take with you when you order the book. Phantom um, um, Films Limited are the only publishing company I know who can reduce 100 pages into, into a little thing like this. <laughs> we won't say about your writing, Richard, it's yeah. fine. <laughs> so Richard, without giving too much away, and if you can remember, what is the story about? What, what, what? Which story? This story. You know the one you wrote. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. What's it about? Yes. It's um, a ripping good yarn. That was the description that um, a certain well-known producer, uh, how he described it when he when, when he saw a very early, early rough. Um, it's. Um, it features a character called Captain Martin Bigglesworth, otherwise known as M. And uh, you can probably gather from his name that um, uh, he, uh, his name actually echoes certain iconic heroes of fact and fiction, Captain Martin mm -hmm. Bigglesworth. And um, he has had an extraterrestrial experience with his colleagues um, who work for um, uh, an organization called, <laughs> it's called Stop It, S-T-O-P-I-T. -T. Now I've just got to see if I can remember what Stop It stands for. Well, we won't say, you can find out in the Yes, book. indeed. That's right, thank you very much. He's let me off the hook, my memory. But Stop It is, a, is, a, is a, an undercover organization that deals with alien attack. And um, Captain Martin Bigglesworth is um, a, um, a particularly efficient young officer. Um, and he is surrounded by very uh, interesting, uh, colourful, um, small group of colleagues. And uh, they usually win because um, evil, uh, good usually beats evil. I nearly said it the other way around. It would be a bit cynical. Maybe in it? the follow up. Perhaps Maybe in the follow up. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, indeed. Um, there's uh, most definitely <laughs> there's most definitely a follow up that um, that that, that uh, you might want to follow up later. Uh, so that yes, there you go. Okay. So that's what it's about. It's about Captain Martin Bigglesworth who leaves his colleagues with great sadness because uh, there has been um, an event in one of the other encounters that Stop It has had, in which. The judgment of Captain Martin Bigglesworth uh, has been put slightly in doubt. And he is very sad to leave his colleagues, and his colleagues are very sad to lose him. So he goes back home to Yorkshire, and he's just going to start again, put it behind him, move into the future. 
but while he's there, something happens of um, a very mysterious nature, and he realizes that he is on the brink of a yet another extraordinary adventure, which he does not want to share with his topic friends because he wants to prove to them that actually he is 110% capable of um, continuing his work. And that is what the story is about. Well, thank you, Richard. Jim? Um, yeah, no, Jim? Water. <laughs> well, water's very nice. Gin. Thank you very much. But it's very good water here, actually. I'm Richard, did what? you say gin? A gin. From Dexter. You think Dexter would buy you a gin? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wishful thinking. Yeah, mm. So... How long, Richard, did it take you to write, and how many drafts of the book were there? A lot. A lot. They I were, mean, wasn't there? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, well, that was rather... Yes. Uh, th that's an in-joke, and it's not a very nice one, actually, because I kept on changing. Well, I mean, I think an author has got to... I, I'm a perfectionist, and that I know is a bit of a cliché, but, you know, you write something, and you're very pleased with it, and then you stand back from it, and you look at it, and you think, I could do better than that. And I really have tried very hard in this book, not just to give you a, a, a trashy little sort of Tupney thriller. I've actually tried to uh, give something with a, a wider vocabulary than usual, with um, uh, more information um, about interesting things and ideas, social, political, Military. What I will say is that every version that you did change, it got better and better, so you did improve it because you, you knew that even if it was a subtle change, it changed. that subtle change helped shape the story and create it into a much better shape. The words are, thank you, the words were very carefully chosen and, um, you know, um, I don't, uh, some people, uh, funnily enough, as a, a friend of mine who's writing a novel at the moment, um, nothing, I mean, I was in Doctor Who, as you know, but um, uh, his novel has absolutely nothing to do with, with science fiction or Doctor Who. But um, uh, I was talking to him, we, we share a dressing room, actually, in the West End. We're both understudying in The Woman in Black. And um, he's read me a chapter, he read me a chapter of his book, which is very good. Um, very precise, very psychological. And yesterday, uh, he didn't speak to me at all in the dressing room. He was just looking at his computer. And um, I said, you've been writing when, when it came to going home time. And he said, no, I've just been uh, researching this, that, and the other. And his, his form of writing is completely different from mine. Mine is a very emotional outpouring. And I look at it, and I think, no, come on, we've got to cut that, add this, tweak that. He tells me, that having done his research, he writes it and that's it. He doesn't touch it. Would you would you say that's a bit because you that's because you're an actor, that you've approached the writing of your book from an actor point of view, where like each each version of your book is like a rehearsal, and then you change bits in rehearsal to get the best performance, which is the that's a very version. interesting analogy actually. But this friend of mine is also an actor. Mm -hmm. But no, I mean uh, Noel Coward, for instance, he wrote. Um, um, he wrote, um, oh, I should forget my own name, Forehander. Blight Spirit? No, not Blight Spirit. Hay Fever? Private no. Lives? What? Private Lives. Private, Private lives. lives, thank you very much indeed. He wrote Private Lives over one weekend with flu. He was in bed with flu. And so uh, three days, bang, play written. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can do that. But, um, uh, no, I, I have actually, it's been sort of, um, I was going to say festering, that's not right. I've been digesting it. It's been, there's been a gestation period, which is different from digesting. Um, for ever since I actually left um, the planet of the spiders. Indeed. Because um, in the book, um, what you've done is you've mi mixed a lot of your own personal life experiences and given them to this character of Martin Biggles Bigglesworth. Would you say that Martin Bigglesworth is an extension of yourself, in a way? Well, if I say that, you'll think I'm the most cocky person out, actually, because Martin Bigglesworth is a cross between Biggles, 007, um, if you like, K-1, 
Captain Mike Yates and Richard Franklin. So, if, uh, you know, I've, if this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek. I mean, I do make him a great perfectionist in this book, and, and uh, I mean, he is a quite superb hero. Mm -hmm. So if I say that, so I'm writing about myself. The, the it sounds a bit awful, the, doesn't it? The reason it, really? why, why I ask that is yeah. because um, you have taken some of your own personal life experiences oh, and put them into this. So how did you find mixing facts and fiction? How was that? Well, I find it, it happens. It's happened all the time in my television experience, particularly, particularly with the long period that I was with Doctor Who, that um, the writers actually in any of the long series, I was on Emmerdale Farm as well, and as the writers get to know you, um, they will, uh, consciously or unconsciously, uh, you find your character drifting closer and closer to yourself. Um, I give you one very clear example. Actually, this is uh, not an Emmerdale Farm example. It's a Doctor Who example. Um, I used to go to rehearsals on a Honda 50 step through, a little, little bike, which I, I loved. It was absolutely great. I did graduate to something rather bigger later. But at the time I was actually rehearsing um, Doctor Who, I used to turn up on this little, little motorbike. And um, the writers thought, oh, that's cool. And they then put me in a story with a 750 twin something or other Was that the demon? Triumph. Was that the demons? Uh, no, it was in um, uh, the one about the, the stolen um, um, missile. Mind of evil. Mind of evil, thank Stop you very much fan indeed. In the room. <laughs> wonderful. You are the most wonderful audience. <laughs> um, if you'd like to come and sit here with me. and, and uh, yeah. Your best prompter out, both of you. Wonderful. Um, yes, no, it's in the mind of evil, and they put me on this bike, which at that stage was much too big for me to handle. I mean, they're very fast and powerful, lovely bicycle, and um, I don't know if you remember that scene, if I can remind you of it. Um, uh, Captain Mike Yates is, is looking through a hedge, watching uh, the, the baddies uh, nick the, the, the missile, and then he gets spotted. And he realizes he's been spotted, so he rushes back to his bike. And the shot should have been me pushing the bike, bump-starting it down the road, which I did incredibly bravely and all the rest of it. But then what happened was I fell flat on my face. <laughs> and the bike literally went woof, straight off. It must have gone, I should think, at 200 yards at least down the road before careering off the road and did a certain amount of damage, I fear, to the bicycle. But they assumed that, you know, I was, I was the sort of uh, uh, king, king biker. Do uh, come and sit down, Take and um, as long as you don't obscure the... Oh, you have. Briefly. Uh, twice. <laughs> <laughs> just, just have a seat, guys, that's fine. That's perfectly all right, don't worry. Thrice. <laughs> no, the back of your hat, I think, is much more interesting than the front of my face, probably, but, uh, so that's fine. Okay. Um, Good. Richard, yeah. um, without giving too much away about the actual book. You've actually dedicated it, which I thought was quite sweet and lovely of you. You've dedicated it to your fans. Oh, yeah. Um, how important have your Doctor Who fans been to you over the years? And do you think they will find any sort of allusions or references possibly to Doctor Who within your book? I think it's very possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say no more. I'll say no more. No, um, the old point about the fans, I've dedicated to the fans, that's you. Well, I presume it's you. Um, uh, I think I put past, present and to come because, and, and this is not just an actor being creepy and sort of trying to ingratiate himself with, with um, uh, uh, public. Um, if it hadn't been for the fans, not only I, but none of the Doctor Who people would, uh, who've done past stories would be here now. I mean, we really um, are hugely indebted uh, to you, not only for the fun that we have, all of us, you and us, I hope, uh, with the Doctor Who conventions and the Doctor Who spin offs and the literature and all that, but actually the work. And, um, uh, you know, you have made it a cult show. You have actually made it, um, well, uh, probably the most famous television series in the world, bar none, actually. But can I just uh, put in, you say the fans have done that, but surely 
you, as one of the actors, and all the other actors have helped do that equally as well. Oh, well, I hope very much so, well, I, yes. I think we could yeah. all agree with that, yeah? Yeah. We... That's a five of you and me later. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yes, it's a two-way thing, yeah. of course, but it's an extraordinary family. Um, without giving too much away, do you have a favourite part of the book that you really enjoyed writing or made you chuckle or you thought, yes, I really enjoy that, that's going to go well? Yes, actually. Um, the bits that I particularly enjoyed were the just very little tiny bit tongue-in-cheek descriptions and relationships with the other characters in my past theatrical television life because um, I've certainly brought them into it. Um, um, <coughs> Or should I say I've drawn on my relationships, uh, which were all extremely good and friendly. And um, I think you'll find, I mean, I hope that it's, it's a book that you really want to read. And when you see this, uh, these two little chapters, I hope you'll think, yeah, I want to read more. What happened before this started? Um, I hope you'll feel that. But, and I hope it's quite uh, mystifying. <clears throat> in parts, but also it's funny. I, and I try to make it funny, and I've tried to make it <clears throat> um, instructive. I won't say educational, but that, that, that's... <laughs> but, no, but I mean, you know, the thing is this, that one of the experiences that I draw from is actually uh, when I was um, an undergraduate at uh, Christchurch, Oxford, um, I went off on a... On a um, a tour with a paint box and a pair of jeans to Morocco and I had an absolutely amazing experience meeting all sorts of people and I haven't put the half of it in here uh -huh. but I, th I hope that what I have put in and brought it into the story um, you know will be will be of interest um, I should say that the story begins in the Chiltern Hills in Berkshire um, which has a childhood memory for me, a very strong one, um, and then moves into Yorkshire, where indeed I lived. Uh, I'm an eighth Yorkshire, I'm very proud of it. Um, it then takes off to Morocco. Um, by a strange chance, uh, we find ourselves in Edinburgh, and it ends up uh, in the way in shop in Harrods. So it's quite, it's quite a bit of variety. There's quite a bit of stuff going on there. You've actually quite preempted my next question quite nicely. Good. Um, you put me on the hot seat. <laughs> I'll put you on the hot seat. Then. So lots of people say yeah. that uh, books can transport them to other places and other times and, and people can lose themselves in a good book. Is this what you hope will happen to the reader? Definitely. I mean, I hope that, uh, that it is more than a Tupney thriller. That's so I hope, yes, uh, maybe there are thoughts... Um, philosophical thoughts, maybe there are um, geographical thoughts uh, and, and, and things that, that you might want to follow up. Um, do we have any questions that you'd like to ask Richard at all? No? Stunned okay. into silence, don't oh. oh yes, that's a good question. What was it like working with John Pertwee on Doctor Who? Uh, well, he's a great comedian. Uh, he's one of the three funniest men I've ever met, actually. Um, he was a great raconteur. I mean, his storytelling was fantastic. Um, the, the, who are the other two people? Well, one of them, um, and I, actually neither of them, I'm afraid you will know, so there's no point in my mentioning them, really. One was a theatre director called Peter Dews, who is now dead, who directed the Birmingham Rep when I was there. And uh, the other one um, was uh, my assistant director when I ran a company in Cumbria called the Renaissance Theatre. But these were all three people who, I can't do it, I don't know whether you can do it. Uh, uh, he, he was, they were natural stand-ups, actually. I don't know, I mean, the good stand-up comics can be absolutely amazing. I, I don't know, they could just... Um, can, um, uh, Dodd, Doddy, was yes. absolutely amazing. I mean, he, you know, do you ever see a programme... I was on television quite a while ago, actually, in which uh, an audience, an invited audience of theatricals, um, asked questions 
to various people like Ken yes, Dodd. Yes, uh, it, it was an audience with. So o- you have an with. audience with Ken Dodd, an audience with so and so. And but amazing. I mean, completely off the cuff. These people come out with the most fantastically I- elaborate jokes. And John, uh, John P was like that. But he could be tough as well. He was uh, got very sniffy if um, you didn't know your lines. And he wasn't the only one who got sniffy about <laughs> it either, actually, because um, we had a very low budget in those days. And, of course, uh, but even now, they, they don't like to spend money unnecessarily, but they do have a million pounds where we had 2,000. So, um, you know, it was... Um, uh, every minute counted. Um, and I'm jolly well going to get my own back on John because he could be sniffy if I had three takes. Normally it would be one or two. But he had seven takes once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm afraid time has beaten us. Um, please do come upstairs and come if you've got any more questions you'd like to ask Richard. Richard will be here for the next hour and a half or so. Um, please come and order the book. We're giving away sample chapters as well. So please come upstairs and have a look around. So thank you very much. If we could just show our appreciation to Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, a very brief sort of encounter, so to speak, if I can coin a phrase. Um, uh, but obviously, we, 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 we hope to sell the book. But I hope you enjoy the book. And I hope you'll read it. Um, it has actually uh, a lot of work has gone into it, uh, not only uh, from myself, but also from Phantom Films, f- uh, for, to whom I'm enormously grateful. That's very thank, you you. Very thank, you. No, thank you very much for thank publishing you. it. And um, I hope and I do believe that you will enjoy it. But if you don't, you can write to me. Or if you do, you can write to me. <laughs> but if you don't, don't follow it up with a punch or (laughs) anything like that, you know. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Thank you.